Well, good morning. Thank you. That was awesome. So you'll have to forgive me today. Yesterday I decided to do something really crazy. I decided that since I was feeling really good, that I would just root through a bag of clothes, just look what's in there, and for about five minutes, and whatever was in that bag attacked me. So... If I go into a sneezing fit, you'll have to forgive me because it just it's still there. So yesterday I was just fine, though. So uh, we're going to continue through the book of Romans. We're in Romans chapter 10 and uh, we're uh, can just uh, as we're studying the book of Romans and we're seeing what's in there for us. Uh, we, we've covered all the way up through chapter 9, and we started chapter 10 last week. And what we're seeing is that Paul is writing to a very specific event that is happening, but is, you know, we can use that, we can take that, and we can apply it to our lives, and we can say, well, what does this mean for us is what Paul is saying. And and what we're seeing in there is that Paul is writing to a church that has this problem with there. There's Jewish believers and there's Gentile believers and trying to uh, you know, bring that together. How, how do we do that if if we have Gentile believers who aren't practicing Judaism and, you know, do we do we have to practice certain things in Judaism or or, or what do we do? Because it's a, I mean, reasonable question in first century church in the, in the first church that they're 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 trying to, you know, figure all of this out. Um, and, and, and so Paul is dealing with this issue of Gentiles and Jewish believers. And as, as we we saw in Romans chapter nine. 30, he says to them, he says, well, what then should we say? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained righteousness, namely the righteousness that comes from faith. But Israel, pursuing the law uh, for righteousness, has not achieved the law. Why is that? Because they did not pursue it by faith. But as if it were by works, they stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, look, I am putting a stone in Zion to stumble over and a rock to trip over. Yet the one who believes on him will not be put to shame. And what, what Paul was, was saying to them is, is that there, there's a righteousness that the Gentiles were pursuing as, and the Jews were pursuing righteousness, but they were they were pursuing it in different ways. And we're going to talk about righteousness today in Romans chapter 10, verses one through four. We talked about submission and we talked about submission and desire and prayer, submission to God's righteousness and submission to grace. And what we see in there, in Romans chapter 10, verses one Uh, Through four, it says, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God concerning them is their salvation. I can testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, because they disregard the righteousness from God and attempted to establish their own righteousness. They have not submitted to God's righteousness for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And so Paul is saying that they that these Gentiles, they have pursued righteousness, but righteousness without knowledge. They didn't know the direction in which they were supposed to be going. They, they didn't know how to obtain this righteousness. And so we're, what we're going to cover today in Romans 10, 5 through 13 is how righteousness happens. And so we're going to talk about righteousness. Now, righteousness, what is righteousness? Righteousness is simply put as right living, the, the way we're supposed to live. It, it's, it's being correct in what we're doing. And, and it's, it's, ha- it's being looked on as being right. Okay, so righteousness is really simple. It's just the, the, the right living 
that, that we're supposed to have. Before we go on, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time, Lord. I ask that you uh, fill us with your Holy Spirit today, Lord, that we might gain from you what you have for us, Lord. We thank you and we praise you in your son's precious name. Amen. In Proverbs twenty one twenty one, it says, The one who pursues righteousness and faithful love will find life, righteousness and honor. He says to us there that if we pursue righteousness, but the Gentiles were pursuing a righteousness, but they had no idea how to get there. The Jews were pursuing righteousness with knowledge, but they still didn't get there. So we're going to look at how righteousness happens today. And the first thing that we're going to talk about in Romans 10, 5 is confidence in the flesh. Romans 10, 5 says, For Moses writes about the righteousness that is from the law. The one who does these things will live by them. So as, as, as Paul continues this, this talk on righteousness, he says the, Jew, the Gentiles, they, didn't, they were pursuing a righteousness, but they didn't know what they were doing. And he goes on, Moses says, he writes about this righteousness that is from the law. The one who does these things will live by them because they were produ- the Jews were pursuing a righteousness from the law. The only way a person can be justified by the law is that they have always kept the law. The only way that we can be justified by the law is that we've always kept the law. So, if I was to ask you, have you ever broken one of the commandments? And if we were going to have an honest conversation, and I say, have you, have you ever broken a commandment? Let's just say ten commandments. Have you ever broken one of the ten commandments? If we're going to be honest, we're going to say, does the law justify me then? And if today I'm going, I keep the ten commandments down, what it's still telling me is that I have broken the commandments, that they have broken God's law. And what Jews were doing is they were suing God by saying, look, we keep your commandments. Now, when Jesus asks the rich young ruler, and the rich young ruler says, uh, uh, Jesus asks, or the rich young ruler asks Jesus, he says, did, did, uh, what can I do to gain eternal life? And Jesus asks and says, well, you must keep your commandments. And he was say, was he lying? Yes. Although he may currently be doing a good job at it, he probably back time and say, I have that one. Oh, I have done the wrong thing there. And we're the same way. We go, I, I, I keep the tenets. But is there ever a time in your life where you can look back and say, I have broken that commandment? And if you're saying, no, I've never broken a commandment, you're lying and breaking one. See how that works out? So what, he's, he, what Moses writes to them about the righteousness that is from the law, he says the one who does these things will live by them. The one who does these things. In Leviticus 18.5, it says, Keep my statutes and ordinances. A person will live if he does them. I am the Lord. He, if we're going to keep the statutes of God, then he, he, he says we, we, we must do them. A person will live if he does them. What's the opposite of if he doesn't do them? He will die. Acts 15.10. This is what the disciples came to. When Paul comes to them and he says, look, uh, I have been out there spreading the gospel and telling the, the Gentiles that they don't have to become Jews. Was I, am I right in that? And when they have a discussion and they've talked for a little while, this is what they said then, is they said, now then, why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the disciples' necks that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? What, what, what is he talking? He's talking about the law. And what is he saying about the law? We have the law. It, it, we, we think the law declares us righteous, but we, ha- we haven't been able to keep it. The Jewish people did not keep the law. And we know this because God tells them, 
is, he says, I want you to keep every commandment that I've given to you. And if you do, you will live long in the land. But if you don't, I will spit you out. And what happens when the kings come into power, they become great nation, then the nation divides, and then Israel and Judah, but these two kingdoms start doing the wrong things, they start breaking the commandments. At one point in time, the temple is even sealed up and nobody knows what's inside of it. And they're out worshiping gods all over the place. Every street corner it says, has a god on it. And when they're breaking the first two commandments. What does eventually God do? He exiles them. A yoke that they couldn't bear. And then when they come back, they still don't do the right things. When, 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 when Jesus comes on the scene, it's, it's so bad that how they've interpreted though They're like, oh, we're devoted to God. It's so bad that they think that they're doing the right things by keeping the law so, so much, that, that so stringently that they're keeping the law that we're, we're serving God. And they're neglecting, and Jesus tells stories like the, 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 the Good Samaritan, where you will keep the law so much you won't even help your neighbor when God has been all about helping people and building people up. And they're saying, why are we putting on them a yoke that we couldn't bear? So, they have a confidence in the flesh. That, that they can do the law. I think many times we, get, we develop this philosophy. That once I'm saved, if I do right and live right, then I'm okay. And we're putting confidence back in the flesh. That I, I can do this. That I can live a righteous life. And we're not seeking after God. We're just saying, God will accept me if I'm good. It's a yoke that they couldn't even bear. What makes us think that we can? When we have confidence in the flesh. Philippians 3, 2 says, watch out for dogs. Watch out for evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision. The ones who serve by the Spirit of God boast in Christ Jesus and do not put confidence in the flesh. Outward signs of righteousness are only outward signs and do not indicate an inward changing by the Holy Spirit. Now, it is true that outward signs will follow an inward change. But if all we have are outward signs, then I am putting confidence in the flesh and not in the saving power of Jesus. See, this is what, this is the difference between, uh, this is one of the things that, that pulled us as Protestants away from the Catholic Church, was we don't, we don't believe in sacraments we, we don't believe that there's any outward sign that we do that gives us more grace under God. That if I do certain things, then God will be more pleased with me and shower more grace upon me. We, we, we have ordinances. We, we take the Lord's Supper, but it doesn't give us any grace, any extra favor from God. We, we go into the, the baptistry, we, we make that confession of faith, and we use an outward sign, but it doesn't give us any more grace. It doesn't put upon us that, oh, well, now this person is more saved than they were before they were baptized. Okay, so, so you following me? These are great things for us to do. We are Baptists, we practice baptism we, we say that there's, there's a way in which the Bible says to do it, but we also don't think that it gives us anything more than uh, just, the, just the grace of God from being saved. It's not like, well, th this person is saved and this person is saved, but this person's been baptized, so they have more grace than this person, okay? 
So what the Jews are trying to do is they're coming into the church and they're saying, if you're not circumcised, then you're not following the complete law of God and therefore you don't have as much grace as these Jewish believers. Okay, that's what's, that's what's coming into the church. And Paul is trying to tell them that this, is, this isn't what's going on because what we're trying to find is not outward displays of change, but inward displays of change. Now, here's what I think has happened in the church. We've, we've, we've still focused on outward and we say, I, I know that person prayed a prayer. I know that person got baptized. So they must be saved. When all the while there was never anything going on inside. They just did the outward sign. I have prayed a prayer with people of salvation that didn't mean one word of it. They just said the words. And we can do that. We, we, we could go through the baptistry, but if, we, if there's nothing going on inside, if the Holy Spirit isn't working, then all we did was get wet. It didn't matter at all. So what Paul is trying to tell them, and what the early church is dealing with, is that we're not looking at outward signs, we're looking at inward changes. Inward changes will be reflected in outward signs. But what's the key? is perseverance. If I have an inward change in me, I will persevere. I will go this way. I will follow Christ. Instead of following the flesh. This is the issue that, that, that Paul and, and the church is, is dealing with. This is, this is what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. Th- listen to Paul's words. He says, Although, <coughs> excuse me, although I once also had confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised the eighth day, the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews regarding the law, a Pharisee regarding zeal, persecuting the church regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. What what is he saying? Because what's coming into the church in Philippi is this, the Greeks are starting to do what the Jews did. Okay, so the the, the Gentiles are starting to do, they're, they're starting to get circumcised and keep the law and make sure you keep the hours of prayer and do all the things so that there's an outward sign that we're Christians. And Paul is going, if anyone has any boasting, it's me. Because I had confidence in the flesh. If anyone thinks he has ground for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Here's my credentials. I was circumcised on the eighth day. Some of you guys weren't. You were circumcised as adults. You're putting confidence in the flesh. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I am a nation of Israel. You guys are Philippians. You see what he's doing? They're putting confidence in the flesh to say that I have an outward sign. And he's saying, that's not what's going on. If that's it, then I'm better than you. But that's not what we believe. That's not what we go after. We don't look at each other and go, well, I'm better than you because I, I have been baptized. (laughs) Matter of fact, I've been baptized twice. I prayed to receive Christ as a child and an adult. And Paul's going, listen, this is not what it is. It's an inward change that we're looking for. This is what's going on. This is how we decide the church is an inward change, not outward signs. Because Paul has every right. If it's by the law, then Paul is better than we are. How does Paul describe himself as an apostle? 
Paul describes himself as the chief of all sinners. The worst of the worst. Why? For the same reason he has to boast. He persecuted the church. If it's by the law, Paul has more. But he's saying that's not the way it is. There's no confidence in the flesh. If we are practicing a confidence in the flesh, then we are not righteous in the eyes of God. He goes on to talk about the message of faith. Romans 10.6, he says, But righteousness that comes from faith speaks like this. Do not say in your heart, Who will go up to heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will go down into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. On the contrary, what does it say? The message is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. This is the message of faith that we proclaim. The true nature of the Christian faith isn't that Jesus has stepped away from us, but that he is always near us and never departs. This is the inward change is that Christ didn't just come in and, and, and then step away from us. He's always present. He's always a part of our life. He's always there. You know, it's, it's, it's funny because I, I, would, I would get into this conversation with my youth when I was a youth pastor, and I would ask them the question, how would your life be different if Jesus was standing right next to you? Oh, and oh man. We start going, well, if Jesus is right there, and I smash my thumb, I go, holy... Jesus, hi. How are you? Because we would do that, right? If, if something is about to happen, or if, if I'm about to curse the guy who cut me off in in traffic and you are the nicest person ever if jesus is sitting right here i'm sorry i'm driving in england that's why i look this way okay we we do that we we would do that but the reality is is that christ is even closer than sitting next to us he is dwelling in us if we're christians and there's going to be a change. Now, I, I don't always listen. Okay? It, it's, it's, you know, husbands, you know this. Wife says, hey, I'm, 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 I'm going to be out of the house. Watch the kids. Okay? Don't give them any candy. I don't always listen to that advice. Okay? And I'm like, you guys want a piece of candy? All right, let's do candy. Because I'm going to be the I'm going to be the parent that they look at and go, that's my favorite parent. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, she is in here. Okay. And then she comes home. Why are there candy wrappers everywhere? I don't know. They they just got into. It, okay. Don't always listen to the advice. Okay. And sometimes I, 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 I'm, I do the wrong thing when Christ is indwelling in me. But I can tell you this, and you can ask my wife. I am not the same person that I was on the day that I got saved. There, there, there's been changes going on in my life. There's constant growing in my life. If we can sit there and say, that's not happening to me, then there's one of two reasons. One, you're stifling the Holy Spirit and He's not working in your life. Two, you're not saved. And if I were you, I would lean towards number two. I'm just going to say that. You, I'll be the messenger. You can be mad at me. But if we're not growing, if we're not changing, if there's nothing happening in my life, if Christ is not working in my life, then chances are I have to sit down and go, am I saved? Because if I am, 
there should be changes happening. I shouldn't, there should be something going on inside my life. Because he's always there. He's always a part of me. Deuteronomy 30, 12, it says, It is not in heaven so that you have to ask, Who will go up to heaven and get it for us and proclaim it to us so that we may follow it? It is not across the sea that you have to ask, Who will cross the sea to get it for us and proclaim it to us that we may follow it? But the message is very near you in your mouth and in your heart so that you may follow it. Paul quotes that to them the message if 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 we're believing in christ if we're trusting we're chasing after christ we we don't need somebody to go up to heaven and bring the message down to us you you don't need to go across oh that, that they have better religion over there i'm going to go over there and get the message it's it's here Christ teaches me. He's a part of me. It's it's the message is in my mouth. It's already there. Jeremiah 31, 33 says, Instead, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. The Lord's declaration, I will put my teaching within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will one teach his neighbor or his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. For the least of the greatest of them, this is the Lord's declaration, for I will forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sin. The message of Christ will be always a part of us because we will understand that he has forgiven our sins once and for all. That this is what Christ has called us to. That, that I'm a part of you. You will know me. You, I have forgiven you. I will place the message on your heart. Because that's where I am. I'm present. I'm there. I'm within you. And the message will be a part of you. Let's talk about true faith. Cover the, the last part. R- remember what he said in, in, in Romans chapter 10. He says, the message is near you. Your mouth and your heart. This is the message of faith we proclaim. Romans 10. Be, this is the message that we proclaim. We're continuing that thought. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness. And one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. Now the scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. Since the same Lord of all is rich to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It is only through confession and belief in the heart that we have access to salvation and never in the traditions and rituals in which we partake. What is he saying to them? Now remember, what's the conflict is between Jews and Greeks, Jews and Gentiles. And look at what he tells them. This is the message. This is the message that is on our lips, that is in our hearts, that we proclaim is this. Let's go back to it in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. He says, this is the message that if we, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Do you need circumcision? Do you need the law? Do you need these things to be saved? Well, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
So he talks to the, the Galatians and he's like, why are you believing all of these things that are going to throw you into slavery again? That if, I want the church to understand this. Now, I know we, we, we put up the Ten Commandments and, 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 and we put them all over and, and, and we, we, we memorize them and we refer to them. And, and I have no problem with that. What I do have a problem with is that we take these things and we say, boom, here's your list you have to live by. And if you mess up, you're not a good Christian. And we put a burden on people that aren't ready for that. The, it, I got saved May 18th, 2000. And I'm pretty sure that on May 19th, 2000, I broke a commandment. I know that it wasn't long after that I was doing something that I shouldn't have been doing. I'll tell you. I did something terrible. May 18, 2000, I was saved. By that summer, I had moved in with a young lady was not married to her okay and yet I'm, I'm breaking the adultery commandment but God's not done with me and God starts to work in me and God starts to do things in my life and he brings me through it and I'm getting convicted and I'm like I can't live this way because there's something going on inside of me and it's breaking me apart that I'm doing this thing and you can get mad at me. And you can say, I can't believe our pastor would do that. He did it. But the change that starts to happen and the prayers that come out of it and I'm falling on my face and I'm saying, God, what do I do? And watch what God does. And how he delivers people from sin because he wasn't done with me. He wasn't through with me on that day. What he said is, you've confessed with your mouth that I'm Lord, but you're not following me as Lord. You're still putting confidence in the flesh. You're still chasing after pleasures of the flesh. And as we start to change and, and turn. Now it was easy for me to put on outward appearances. That's easy. But to deal with the change going on inside, that hurts. Because we have to walk into the light. And we don't like the light. We like darkness more than the light. Because the light exposes us. This is what Paul is talking about. You're not righteous because you sacrifice bulls and sheep. You're not righteous because you got circumcised. You're not righteous because you can stand back and say, I keep all the commandments. That doesn't declare you righteous. What declares us righteous is that I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved because it's his righteousness that covers me. And not my own. And he says, look, you believe and it's resulting in righteousness. You chase after God. You chase Jesus Christ. You follow him. And you will live righteously. He's not going to lead us down terrible paths. He's not going to lead us into temptation. He's going to deliver us from the evil one. And he says, 
If you confess with your mouth, it's resulting in salvation. You're saved. Now the scripture says everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. Since the same Lord of all is rich to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Who is excluded? No one. Look, when you get into this and you start to run this through your mind and you start to examine the Scriptures, God isn't excluding anyone. There's no one He said, well, you will be saved and you won't be. There's no one to which He says, I've elected you but not you. It's to everyone. And he says, what sin have you committed? Well, I've broken the law. You're excluded now? No. There's a righteousness that comes by grace. Because in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. It is through true belief in God and his son that we are able to dwell in the presence of God. I want to ask them to come and play. You may be you may be a Christian there today who says, I know that I believe, but I've 